The last thing we need to cover when talking about polymers is polymer crystallinity. It's weird to think of polymers, plastics, like this, as being crystalline materials, but they can have significant portions of crystallinity. Depending on your polymer, you can almost achieve 100% crystallinity, right? So while the normal picture is to think of them as a bunch of spaghetti strands all mingled together, it can be the case that you can get significant crystallization. Here's how it works. Instead of the entire chain forming a crystal, you get regions of the chain that fold in on itself to get crystals. So you end up with this. You might get a portion of your chain folding up and then another portion of your chain folding up and then maybe different things like this happening, right? Um, so where these chains fold back in on itself, you typically have reasons. You've got good secondary bonding between portions of the chain, like nylon 6-6, we saw the hydrogen bonding that can occur. So let's see if we can see this happening. If you look in Vesta, you can see how the chains can fold in on themselves, and these dashed lines represent, you can see that's a hydrogen bond, right? Oxygen and hydrogen right there, these are forming hydrogen bonds in on itself as it's able to fold. So this is an example where it does, it's have a, it has a repeating three-dimensional periodic lattice. This is a, a crystal, right? They're completely crystalline materials in this block, right? Then the block might end and it might do something amorphous for a while, which is non-crystalline, right? And then it might start up with another crystalline block, right? So it's better to think of it as having degrees of crystallinity or regions of crystallinity dispersed through an amorphous matrix, right? Now, what do you expect for density? Hopefully it's clear that you would expect a higher density in these crystalline regions than in these amorphous regions, right? In the crystalline regions, they're packed together quite tightly, right? Because they're trying to maximize bonding, and so you get higher density. You get lower density in the amorphous regions, right? Because of that, you can actually use measurements of density to estimate crystallinity. This is pretty cool. So the percent crystallinity right here, it would be equal to the density of the crystalline state. So if you knew what its density was, if it was 100% crystalline, now you multiply that by the quantity of the density of your sample minus the density of it if it was completely amorphous, then you divide that by the density of your sample times the quantity of the density of your crystalline minus your amorphous material. That would give you the percent crystallinity of your sample, which is pretty cool. And essentially it's saying that if your amorphous material is over here, density and your crystal materials over here and your samples in the center. It's essentially a rule of mixtures to get between them, but it's a really cool tool for calculating crystallinity. You do need to know the density of your amorphous sample and the density of your crystalline samples, but you can usually find those in the literature. Um, now what can you do to influence crystallinity of polymers? Well, slowly cooling through the melting point allows for better packing, right? So cooling it down slowly gives it time for these polymers to arrange and stack up nicely, so you tend to get better crystallinity. It's harder to get better crystallinity if you've got a complex MER structure with big bulky side groups that can't rotate easily. They're going to tend to be amorphous instead of crystalline, right? Um, some structures, it's actually really hard to prevent crystallization. Polyethylene, polytetrafluoroethylene, these crystallize really quickly. Even if you cool it down quickly, they're going to crystallize, right? Um, linear structures are more crystalline than branched ones, obviously. Networked, cross-linked, or heavily branched are all going to be pretty much totally amorphous. They're not going to be crystalline at all. Um, and then with stereoisomers, we already talked about this, but atactic will be amorphous, whereas isotactic or syndiotactic can tend to crystallize quite easily. Uh, and we've already talked about large bulky side groups. And what's interesting is that you can actually do the same things uh, with diffraction of polymers as you did with inorganic materials. Um, normally you think of polymers and when you put them in the X-ray diffractometer you just get this amorphous bump if it's not crystalline at all. This is called diffuse scattering, we won't cover it in this class. But if your crystal is, um, if your polymer has crystalline regions, you might get an amorphous bump but with some peaks on top of it. And these peaks correspond to HKL values just like before. Meaning you could figure out what the interplanar spacing is, you could figure out the, the type of crystal structure, cubic, tetragonal, orthorhombic, for your polymer, and you could calculate using Bragg's Law where you'd expect to see reflections. Um, and again, so the last thing here is, again, you've got amorphous regions and crystalline regions, and these things sort of grow into what are called micelles, um, which are typically small but can grow larger if you give it time and temperature. So that is everything you need to know about polymers for this Intro to Material Science class.